if you had graduated from a law school in South Carolina, you didn't have to take the state bar examination. You were admitted under what became popularly known as the diploma privilege. Um, now, when, when the law school at South Carolina State was created, uh, the officials decided, well, look, we've got to do something about this, this diploma, diploma privilege. And so they uh, persuaded the legislature to, to enact a law requiring the taking, the passing of the bar examination by all law school graduates. Perry goes on to say that he jokes with law students and tells them to blame him for having to take the bar exam. So let's get into this, too, because a lot of times people will say, well, it affects all law, law, law students. So therefore, it's white and black. So how would that be racist? Well, if you have a school of law students and the law students in that school that are predominantly black are under resourced, that means that they're not going to get as adequate of an education as the ones that are predominantly white. Therefore, if they're not getting as adequate of an education, that means that they are actually going to be disadvantaged and less likely to pass the bar exam. It goes without saying that being black in America, there's a lot of different hurdles that you have to jump over. You have to work 10 times as hard to get half as far in this country. You can see it in many different sectors. Hell, you even see it in independent media. There's times where I'll see people like myself, Nico House, RBN, Savvy Sabs. I feel like they should be further along. If not myself, the rest of the Black content creators should be further along than what they are. And it's not because they're not doing the, the damn thing. Part of me thinks that, yeah, unfortunately, racism, both interpersonal and systemic, still has a major effect in our country. Well, this is no different than in the justice system or lack thereof. So there was a story that I came across speaking about the bar exam. So I want to go into this because there's one state actually that's getting rid of the bar exam for lawyers and it's actually a good thing. So let's get into this. So I wanna share this, my screen really fast because this is gonna be interesting. Let's get into it. Go just uh, perfect. In tonight's fact or fiction, we're looking into a recent headline you may have seen. It claims that you no longer have to pass the bar exam to become a lawyer in Washington state. And it's actually true. Last Friday, the Washington state Supreme Court ruled that lawyers can get a license for going the bar by participating in a six-month apprenticeship and completing three courses. Propon now, my question is, why was the bar exam there in the first place? Because I was always under the impression that the bar has been there since the beginning and, uh, you know, the bar, it, it's kind of like um, the real estate brokers test everybody that has to go to be a real estate agent you have to take the state exam for to become a real estate agent well i thought this was you know to make sure that you are certified and being able to teach the law but is the bar really necessary in order to practice law within your given state well she goes a little bit further and yes, it has to do with race. Let's go. 
Proponents say the traditional bar exam isn't very effective and blocks marginalized groups from becoming attorneys. Washington is actually the second state not to require the bar exam following Oregon. We'll be right back. Wow. So apparently to become a lawyer, because in this country, in most states, in order to become a lawyer, you have to pass the bar exam. There is no path forward for you to practice law outside of that. And this exam, if proponents are saying that it blocks out, gatekeeps marginalized communities largely, well, isn't that really just telling us and confirming for us that the system is racist? It talks about systemic racism, right? And then when we want to pursue justice within the system, unfortunately for us, it's always going to side against us due to the color of our skin. Even when it comes to matter, civil matters, it could be matters in conducting business. You know, it, it, it always goes against us. Hell, to become a lawyer is getting into a, a, a economic bracket that is not afforded to many of us people. But if that's gate kept due to the color of your skin, of course, that's also going to affect us as far as class. Because there's some people who I think that should have been lawyers a long time ago, but they're like, well, <laughs> eight years of law school, then you have to pass the bar exam. That's a whole bunch of money that you have to pay just to just to be able to become a lawyer. So, of course, economically, it affects us disproportionately than it does white people. And there's history behind that. So I want to get into this uh, video that actually talks about it. Take this down. Let me see. So this is going to be the history behind South Carolina's bar exam. And I'm going to talk about a particular gentleman. Now, this gentleman's name is Matthew Perry. Now, not to do from friends. This is a former judge. And he speaks about having to battle to become a lawyer in Jim Crow South. So let's get into this as well. Being Black in America comes with an array of barriers rooted in years of racism, discrimination, violence, and so much more. School systems have attempted to withhold the true knowledge of Black history through institutionalized racism and blocking direct access to resources. But of course, this doesn't stop the willpower and determination of the many brilliant minds of our ancestors and people of today. Matthew J. Perry, former judge of the U.S. District Court of South Carolina, is a true definition of knowledge is power. Born in Columbia, South Carolina in 1921, Perry was born into the Jim Crow era of segregation and discrimination, in an exclusive interview conducted by Joseph Mosnier for the Civil Rights History Project, Perry dove deep into his life before he even started practicing law. I um, was a student at, uh, at South Carolina State College when, uh, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Um, uh, a national draft occurred, and I was, of course, a young person who fit within the uh, age brackets. And I received my notice uh, 1942. And uh, I reported for, for duty uh, near the 1st of, of, uh, of January 1943. Perry always recognized the unequal treatment amongst Black folks, but he didn't fully process how much of an issue it was until he was drafted in the war in 1942. His firsthand experience with racism catapulted him into learning more about the law 
and studying several cases of his day. He recalls sitting in on two different trials in Colombia when he returned home from war. One being George Elmore, who was denied the right to vote in the Democratic primary election, which is a violation of the 15th Amendment. Elmore, who also happened to be represented by Thurgood Marshall, eventually went on to win this case. Then there was the case of John Ryden, who applied to enter law school at the University of South Carolina, an all-white university. He was denied entry, of course, because of his race, and so he sued the school. Also represented by Thurgood Marshall, Ryden eventually won his case, and as a result, the state decided to implement a law school at one of the Black institutions, South Carolina State College, formerly known as the Colored Normal Agricultural and Mechanical College at Orangeburg. The school hired faculty and a dean for law students to properly begin their studies, although they were greatly under-resourced compared to their white university counterparts. Now, hang on. They talk about greatly under-resourced. Well, why would they be greatly under-resourced? I thought it was all due to class. You see, the, the, the issue is, is that being black is also in itself a class. Let me ask you this, which one is it better? Is it better to be poor and white or poor and black? <laughs> being black is a class in itself when you think about it. And so when it comes to black people who are trying to become lawyers, well, of course, even then in law school, you're under-resourced, especially if it's a school that's predominantly black that's training people to get their JD. Mind you, this wasn't that long ago. We're not talking about hundreds of years ago. You know, I'm talking about people that's maybe a few years older than my mom. People, this guy is what old enough to be my grandfather. It's not that old. My grandmother passed last year. So keep in mind. This case in particular became the turning point in Matthew Perry's quest for purpose in finding his career. The racial practices that I had become increasingly aware of uh, weighed with me. Uh, could I enter some field or study some field that might better equip me to understand what I was looking at, to understand the reasoning for it, and to perhaps, uh, along with others, try to find w some solutions to them. Venturing into a... And some of those solutions involve learning things like critical race theory, which is taught in law schools, in order to be able to circumvent the racial prejudice that has been input, implanted into, baked in really, into our justice system. So when people talk about, oh my God, critical race theory, CRT is going to ruin us all, that's BS. Because to be able to weave through and to counteract the systemic racism within our system, that's why it exists, especially in law schools, so that people like former Judge Perry, as well as many black lawyers especially, can be able to get true justice for people who are marginalized. And I would like to add that weaving through this justice system and building case law and precedence and, you know, and piercing through the systemic racism that's in our justice system will also in turn indirectly benefit white people too. Because if they do it to us, that means they're going to do it to you too as we have seen with many of the different things, especially in the criminal justice system. 
So ultimately, everyone benefits. Let's continue. Some solutions to them. Venturing into adulthood, Matthew decided to attend law school, not only to gain knowledge, but to gain a deeper understanding of why the very field he was entering was meant to oppress Black people. Everything changed when Perry finally joined law school in 1951. If you had graduated from a law school in South Carolina, you didn't have to take the state bar examination. You were admitted under what became popularly known as the diploma privilege. Um, now, when, when the law school at South Carolina State was created, uh, the officials decided, well, look, we've got to do something about this, this diploma, diploma privilege. And so they uh, persuaded the legislature to, to enact a law requiring the taking, the passing of the bar examination by all law school graduates. Perry goes on to say that he jokes with law students and tells them to blame him for having to take the bar exam. So let's get into this too, because a lot of times people will say, well, it affects all law, law, law students. So therefore it's white and black. So how would that be racist? Well, if you have a school of law students and the law students in that school that are predominantly black are under-resourced, that means that they're not going to get as adequate of an education as the ones that are predominantly white. Therefore, if they're not getting as adequate of an education, that means that they are actually going to be disadvantaged and less likely to pass the bar exam because they're not going to be as prepared. They're not going to be as educated as their white counterparts because of the under-resources that are given. It's the same thing that happens even in households that are or neighborhoods that are black as compared to our white. A lot of times there is a disparity. The disparity is very unequal. The disparity tends to be, well, white neighborhoods tend to be more better resourced than black neighborhoods. Now, this is not all 100% absolute because there are very poor white neighborhoods as well. But at the same time, you see the disparity in as far as the percentage of white people that are more affluent versus the percentage of black people that are more affluent. So I think this is one of the pieces that a lot of people do not think about. A lot of people do not, a lot of people miss. And then on top of it, why do black people celebrate when another black person becomes a lawyer? Because we're under-resourced, because we just don't have it. When a black judge you know, appears, it's like, oh my God, a black judge, you know? And typically in order to be able to become a lawyer, that's money that you have to, you know, either student loans or you're privileged to be able to get a scholarship. And then a lot of times you have to be privileged enough to go to a well-resourced school. So guess what? That means that you have to come from means. How many judges out there, how many lawyers out there that are black that have come from poor neighborhoods, that have come from the hood, that actually made it out? You know what I'm saying? It's not just a diversity of skin color, it's also a diversity of class. Not very diverse a lot of times. A legislator wrote to his colleague that the requirement would bar Negroes and some undesirable whites from practicing in the state. Undesirable whites. Undesirable whites? If they do it to us, they're going to do it to you too. See what I mean? Mm -mm. Let's continue. A legislator wrote to his colleague that the requirement would bar Negroes and some undesirable whites from practicing in the state, according to Dr. William Hine, who taught history at SC State for decades. The low number of Black graduates who passed the test after studying in an underfunded school with a scant library proved him correct. History, of course, will 
will support my assertion that uh, it was not uh, it was not an equal uh, facility. In fact, Thurgood Marshall referred to it as a, a Jim Crow dump. Matthew Perry was the only student to pass the bar in his graduating class. He went on to Spartanburg to practice law for the next 10 years and develop his career. After his return to Columbia in the early 1960s, Perry discovered that although he had the education and experience, as a young Black man in the South, he was overlooked in many regards, so he decided to open up his own law office. It took Perry years to build a solid clientele, especially considering he lost his first few cases to a clearly racist judge who wouldn't even allow Perry to present his case before finding the person guilty. Perry then learned how to draft a notice of appeal over the decision, and it reached the Supreme Court. Perry finally won his case and got the decision reversed. From then on, word began to spread of Matthew Perry, and as the years went on, his clientele began to grow even more. He went on not only to fight cases on behalf of civil rights protesters and in the name of segregation, but he even became South Carolina's first black U.S. District Court judge in 1979 and went on to serve for more than 25 years. 1979. 1979 was 45 years ago. 45. I'm 40. See what happens when you when you gauge it by that? I'm 40. And that was 45 years ago. So it's not that long. I know I look great for 40, but still, right? <laughs> 45 years ago? Finally in 2004, the new U.S. courthouse in Columbia was named in honor of Judge Perry. So many others have continued in Perry's footsteps and have served in the judicial system on all levels. The power of knowledge is infinite, and it's in the hands of those willing to grab a hold of it. History will only continue to repeat itself if, as a culture, we don't fully take the time to acknowledge our roots and those who want to uproot our history. The choice is ours. This is Naya Reynolds with Polish. So that really is the history of the bar exam in regards to how black people have been treated. And we also have to remember wherever you need anything, legal proceedings, you know, in many different forms of our lives, you know, even when it comes to you owning a business, it, you know, your access to lawyers that actually would understand you that would look out for you you know sometimes you do need somebody who looks like you in order to understand because they know they have a life experience that's similar to yours it's not uh part and parcel all the time because yeah there are some black lawyers that probably don't know what it's like to live in the hood what it's like to be racially profiled or they just are not aware right but it's important that that it, that barrier is lifted because of the racist history. We live in a, you know, we, we don't, I don't live in a fantasy world where, you know, oh, well, you know, post Obama, you know, we don't live in a racist country no more. No, nah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It, it's, we live, we still live in a system where racism is still inherently in the fiber of the system. Just look at the 13th Amendment of the United States. It still has an exception for slavery in it. So therefore, that means there's still racism that is still embedded in our system. Absolutely. And we still see it time and time again. Look at the law enforcement that continuously disproportionately affects uh, those of us who are black. So this is why I say it's a class and race issue. It's a class and identity issue. Because the thing is, is that the people who want to become lawyers, they can't because they're, they're blocked from either having to take this bar exam, 
which disproportionately affects black people. And or it also makes it so that we are ultimately paywalled away from actually pursuing law in the first place. Now, I'm applauding this this move by the Washington State Supreme Court because ultimately, I honestly do not think really the exams like this should really exist. As long as you got the training, then why is there a need for a bar exam? So another big shout out to Roger Meadows. Uh, this talks about Washington no longer requires passage of a bar exam to practice law. Says the Washington Supreme Court ordered on Friday, March 15th, that attorneys now have an alternative pathways in lieu of the bar exam to become licensed to practice law in Washington state. Says the Washington state bar licensure task force cited that the bar exam disproportionately and unnecessarily blocks marginalized groups from practicing law while it's escalating a law desert across the state. In addition to the racism and classism written to the test itself, the time and financial cost of the test reinforced historical inequities in our profession. Despite these issues, data indicates that the bar exam is at best minimally effective for ensuring competent lawyers. Among the deficiencies and common complaints about the bar exam is that it bears little resemblance to actual practice and tends to simply restate the same results already provided by law school grades. It says the task force was created by the Washington State Supreme Court on November 20th, 2020 to assess the efficacy of the Washington State bar requirements for licensing lawyers, according to the Supreme Court documents, as well as to consider alternatives to the current licensing requirements and to analyze potential alternatives. On October 11, 2023, the WBLTF presented its proposals to the future of Washington State bar emissions. Those proposals were then updated on February 28, 2024, following a round of public comment. Those proposals included seven recommendations to the court to modify requirements needed to practice law in Washington. Of those, the court accepted recommendation through two through six, which relate to graduating from an apprenticeship program, law school experiential pathway, APR six apprenticeships, law clerk program, alternative assessments and interventions, and reciprocity. It says the entire list of proposed recommendations include, one, maintain the bar exam in its current form for those who choose to take it while advancing the cause of improvement to the bar exam. Two, create an experiential uh, pathway to practice for law school graduates. Three, create an experiential pathway to practice for law school students. Four, create an experiential pathway to practice for APR six clerks. Five, recommend WSBA research with the goal of implementation assessments that identify strengths and growth areas for lawyers and specific training programs that can be implemented throughout the course of a lawyer's career. Six, reduced time requirement for admission by a motion to one year and seven, lower the cut score for bar exam passage back to 266. These proposed reforms relate only to the bar exam. Participants in each proposal are still expected to complete a all Washington licensure requirements other than the bar exam. These recommendations come from a diverse body of lawyers in private and public practice, academics and researchers who contribute immense insight, counterpoints, and research to get us where we are today. So that was from Justice Raquel Montoya Lewis. That's from the Washington State Supreme Court. With these alternative pathways, we recognize that there are multiple ways to ensure a competent licensed body of new attorneys who are so desperately needed around the state. What this means essentially is that law students can now complete a six month apprenticeship program while being supervised and guided by a practicing attorney. Also by completing three 
different courses, law students can become certified after completing 500 hours of relevant work practicing as a legal intern, and law clerks can become attorneys without entering law school by completing standardized educational materials while also fulfilling the 500 hour legal intern requirements. Says so Washington now becomes the fourth state in the nation to offer alternative options to practice law following Oregon, which adopted a similar change in requirement earlier this year. Wisconsin and New Hampshire are the previous two. Other states that are considering alternatives to the bar exam require requirement include Minnesota, Nevada, South Dakota, and Utah. So this is a good thing because now there is many different pathways for people to, to practice law. And it is going to open up the floodgates for more people who are marginalized to really know the law and to practice law so that for instance, if you're the average worker, that person has a background similar to you and they will be able to defend you in court. They would be able to represent you in court. And then this can also in turn lead to judges that also have the same background as you. They don't come from some upper echelon of society pedigree. And so therefore they're actually able to judge more fairly when it comes to workers and average people. I say it's a good thing. So I think it's important that we look at the background as to why the bar exam actually exists and also work towards implementing more different changes so that more people can be truly represented according to the law. Because the thing is that if the law is supposed to be for all people, why can't all people represent it? Why can't all people practice it? equally and equitably? I think that's the question that many of us should ask. Thank you so very much for watching my channel and I deeply appreciate it from the top and bottom of my heart. If you wish to support the channel further so I can keep bringing you content that is educational and informative, you can become a patron on patreon.com forward slash jbfon. You can find that link in the pinned comment or in the description below. No matter what you give, you'll be supporting independent media and education that helps make the world better. Thank you so much. And you can watch more of my content here. Forehead kisses and have a beautiful day.